Dinesh D'Souza, you have written uh, the, the End of Racism. I mean, I won't get into in much detail what you have to say here. But I mean, you start from really almost turning a lot of the liberal analysis of racism on its ear by claiming that uh, racist society, as we've known it historically, and a lot of the defenses the black community has put up against a racist society are out of date, outmoded, that they're no longer uh, needed. G give me a little bit more insight into that background. Look, there are three possible reasons why groups can differ. Uh, the first is genes or genetic differences. The second is culture. Uh, and the third is, is discrimination right. and its External institutional barriers. legacy. Right. Uh, I reject both the, the liberal view, which holds that uh, black failure is largely or, or mainly due to discrimination, uh, and I reject the view that it's genetic. So I focus on cultural differences. Uh, and I point out, for example, that in, that in virtually every measure of academic achievement or economic performance, we find uh, not just whites, but immigrants, uh, Cubans, uh, West Indians, uh, Koreans, uh, leapfrogging ahead of American blacks and claiming the fruits of the American dream. I think that this is because blacks have developed a culture that represents an adaptation to historical circumstances, but one that is today in some respects a liability or dysfunctional. Well, it's interesting because not only have you kind of turned a lot of the liberal arguments that the impediments to black society are externally set up by, by the white community, but you go further and say that this should be kind of a, an uplifting analysis for the black community because it says genetically you're not stuck and that you shouldn't be so fatalistic to believe that the only way your lot in life is going to improve is when white society I improves, uh, improves, improves their attitude. Yet is it being received as an uplifting message by, by the black community? Well, uh, Thomas Sowell, the uh, uh, black writer, says of this book that the end of racism is a heartbreaking book because the truth is heartbreaking. Uh, it is a tough book, as I say, and yet it's a hopeful book because if our problems are in our genes, we can't do anything about right. them. And if, our, if the problems of blacks are due to white racism, I don't know of any way, um, uh, even if we could magically get rid of white racism overnight, this would do nothing to increase black test scores, uh, improve black savings rates or black rates of business formation, or strengthen black families, or reduce black on black crime. Those are the most serious problems facing blacks. Now, for a generation, People have said you cannot point at these problems because to do so is blaming the victim. Right. When uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan wrote his report on the black family in the 60s, the illegitimacy rate for blacks was 25%. He said it was a national tragedy, and people said, you're a racist. Stop talking about it. And he did. He hasn't said a word about it since. The illegitimacy rate for blacks in the United States today is close to 70%. So when these problems are ignored, they metastasize, they become far worse. On the other hand, if they are recognized and acknowledged, I'm confident that they can be addressed. What caused that pathology or that, that culture that, that you document and itemize as, as this, what you see as the source problem? Well, first of all, it's not solely caused by poverty. One of the contributions of the book is it disputes the so-called culture of poverty analysis that goes back to the 60s. I point out, for example, that Asians and whites who come from poor families making less than $20,000 a year score higher on tests of academic achievement um, than blacks who come from families earning over $60,000 a year. I point out that poor blacks have a much higher illegitimacy rate than poor whites, for example and so on. I think one of the reasons for this is that blacks have developed, blacks have had a unique experience in the United States, differing from that of immigrants. And it's not surprising that as a result of that experience, blacks have developed a culture, a set of attitudes, values, behaviors um, that are formed out of the crucible of that experience. For example, I point out that while Americans have traditionally been hostile to the federal government, viewing it as the enemy of rights. Mm -hmm. For blacks, the federal government has been a deliverer of rights, a provider of rights. Uh, it was the federal government that ended both slavery and segregation and played a crucial role in employing a lot of blacks in this century. It was uh, the main force behind affirmative action, for example. Many blacks owe their middle class status to the government. So it's not surprising that blacks have a cultural orientation that looks at government sympathetically. You know, we have recently this million man march on Washington. Blacks always marching on Washington. Uh, looking to the government for answers. Meanwhile, other groups are setting up entrepreneurial associations, rotating credit systems, and within a generation, their daughters are valedictorians and they have moved to the suburbs. I think that we need to realize that the government is today not, a very good, not in a very good position to address these problems. It doesn't have the resources, uh, and public confidence in the government is at an all-time low. When you talk about this culture or the pathology of the black community, I mean, reliance on government, the normalization of illegitimacy, the worship of the outlaw, 
a hero and see these as, as kind of the negative attributes that in fact are keeping the black community back. I mean, others have pointed those same attributes as almost kind of the evidence of the authenticity of black culture, saying that if you can't compete with white society, you have to have some esteem, and that this, in fact, is we shouldn't be measuring black culture against white cultural yardsticks, I guess. Well, that's the legacy of cultural relativism, which is the main target of my book, which says, in effect, that all cultures are equal and no culture can judge another by its own standard, and culture should not impose their values on each other. Mm -hmm. I argue that this relativism played an important historic role. It helped to undermine the old racism, which was based on the notion of a hierarchy. The old racists basically said that you have savages, you have barbarians, and you have civilization, and we whites are the only people capable of civilization. Right. Relativism was a way to undermine that racist totem pole, but it's created a new problem because it now makes it difficult to recognize that black culture is in some respects uh, inferior to white culture, at least functionally inferior, inferior to achieve those um, ingredients of success that blacks and whites both want. And so what we need is a project of cultural restoration that is aimed at improving study habits, strengthening families. I think the three institutions that need to be strengthened are the church, the family, and the small business. Those are the key to any restoration in the inner cities of the United well, there, States. There has been, though, in, in recent years, a growth of a black middle class. And so there has been advancements that, that have been made. There's no question there's a, a disparity between that growth of the middle class and the, uh, what appears to be a permanent underclass. But why are some of the members of the black community moving forward while, while others clearly aren't? Well, it's one of the great ironies of desegregation and affirmative action. People forget that uh, segregation subsidized the ghetto uh, in a weird way because segregation essentially uh, guaranteed that a black lawyer, a black doctor, a black school teacher, a black drug dealer, and a black pimp all lived on the same street. Uh, and so with the middle class being forced to live in the inner city, uh, you had uh, a semblance of, of middle class norms, mm -hmm. even in, amid segregation. What's happened now is because of opportunities and because of racial preferences and so on, middle class blacks, those with skills and resources, have, have left. So white flight in the 70s has been followed by black flight. And, and middle class blacks have taken with them valuable economic and cultural resources. So we have a seesaw effect. The middle class has gone up and the underclass has gone down. Uh, the conditions of the underclass have become worse in the past 25 years. And it is that that is now the most serious challenge for public policy and, and for our American culture. Now, you reject the notion that American society is systemically racist, but you do say that we practice, which, which you've introduced a term, it's interesting, rational discrimination. That is that, that we do discriminate, but that there is a certain rationalism to the, the way we, uh, we, we discriminate. And I think one of the examples that's used all the time is the, the cab driver who might be driving past a black youth in urban America will not pick them up because their experience is that a black youth is five times more likely to commit violent crime than, uh, than, than a, a, a white youth. Uh, but that, that analysis, what does that do for the black youth who is law-abiding and isn't part of, of, of that underclass who gets passed by, by the cab driver? Uh, that's a very good question. And uh, see, I think our debate on this kind of subject is, um, is terribly uh, polarized and irrational now because what happens in effect is that black activists say the cab driver is a bigot. Uh, even if it happens to be a, a Lebanese cab driver or a West Indian or a Nigerian or a black cab driver acting no differently than a white cab driver, they say, well, he's just internalized white racism. So the cab driver is presumed to be a bigot, and the cab driver presumes uh, that the black activist is crazy because mm -hmm. he cannot understand that all the cab driver is trying to do is get home to his wife and family. The concept of rational discrimination allows us to say that we have a distinction to be made between rationality and morality. The cab driver is acting rationally. He is trying to protect his property and security. Um, and the law-abiding young black who's passed up by a cab is appealing to morality. What he's saying is, I have a right to be treated as right. an individual based on the content of my character. To which the cab driver responds, I would love to do that, but frankly, I'm not in a position to get to know my customers personally. Uh, if I could ask you about your family, about your crime rate, about whether you have a criminal record and so on, it would be one thing. So we have a tragedy. And I think what we have to do is ask whether the, the law-abiding African-American's right not to be inconvenienced, right to get a cab, is more important, or the cab driver's right to protect his life and his cab. And I think that in this case, it is the cab driver's right that is more important. So you go a step further. You say that, that rather than focusing on the cab driver as a bigot, what this law-abiding black youth who can't get 
the, 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 the cab ride, or in fact get stopped unduly by the police because they have that same kind of socialization, that same experience of dealing with black violence, black crime. What he should be doing is blaming his black brethren who is a who, who is a who, who is a criminal, and that that in fact, or if not blaming, at least recognizing that that is the source of the problem. Look, immigrant groups have always said, for example, Italian communities living in, in New York would always be exceptionally angry uh, if the grandson Vito was caught stealing or was caught involved in some crime, because they would say, "Look, you are giving the Italian community a bad name. In other words, you are making us all look like we are part of the mafia or part of organized crime, and we will be especially severe on you." There is absolutely no such accountability at least on no systematic level in the, in the black community, that the reason that the cab driver is acting this way is, is because the Sentencing Commission, a liberal advocacy group, recently released a study. One in three African Americans in the United States is on any given day in prison, on parole, or on probation. These are staggeringly high crime rates. And the point is, by changing those patterns of behavior, we make rational discrimination less likely. I argue that that's the best anti-racism now. But, and in doing this, I mean, you also kind of excoriate a lot of the, the, the black leadership. I mean, you call them race merchants, the notion that they profit, they exist by virtue of having an underclass. Uh, well, I say that they, they, that they recognize that the scandalous sufferings of the underclass provide the political capital that justifies transfer payments to the middle class. In other words, right now, for example, there are programs that mainly benef benefit middle class blacks in which the government provides set-asides, discounts in buying radio stations, preferences to get into Princeton and so on. Believe me, there are no blacks from the very few blacks from the ghetto going to Princeton. It's the sons and daughters of Jesse Jackson, of government workers, of Hispanic doctors and so on. So the point is this. If, the, if somehow the ghetto disappeared overnight, if we could imagine, if it could so somehow end, isn't it true that Americans would immediately begin to say, well, why is Jesse Jackson's kids, who have every advantage in life, getting a preference to, get, to go to Berkeley or getting a government contract? The, the political capital that supports these preferences would disappear. So there is a weird dependency. Uh, not, not, it's not that the underclass is dependent on the civil rights establishment, it's the other way around. But that, I mean, that says a terrible thing about the, the motivation of, of a lot of these leaders. I mean, you can't truly believe that Jesse Jackson wouldn't be absolutely delighted in the eradication of poverty or, or uh, oh, racism. Oh, absolutely. And I'm He's not, not doing this so his kids can go to Princeton. On no, no, no. I, I'm not saying that. But I think there's, there's a sophisticated form of economic and political analysis that recognizes now that institutions develop vested interests. For example, the civil rights movement has an institutional interest in blaming racism for black problems and in not paying much attention to the most tragic sufferings of the underclass. And therefore, if you look at a group like the NAACP, it's much more concerned about finding out that there are people who go to Denny's who can't get a meal, mm -hmm. and much less concerned, for example, with programs to strengthen black families. Now, you've obviously provided, you know, some intellectual depth to a relatively conservative conservative argument and as a consequence of you know the, the power of your intellectual argument I mean you're taking seriously whether people agree with you or not I mean do you worry however that that some of the arguments that you put forward uh, provide refuge for the true racist I mean there's some some stuff in here that if I was David Duke I'd be going oh boy now I've got a really really good intellectual foundation for my otherwise you know creepy and repugnant views this is what I call the sleeping with the enemy problem, that, that people, that there's a sense that you should not make legitimate arguments because illegitimate use may be made right. of them. I think that the opposite is true, that, that the public taboos surrounding race, the fact that people cannot speak what's on their mind. When I often speak on campus, as young people will come up to me and they say, well, uh, much of what you say makes sense, but I'm white. I could never say that. I would be hounded off the podium. Well, you talk about your own ethnic immunity. That, That's right. That by virtue of coming from Bombay, you can say things that... A white Absolutely. guy couldn't say. And, and, and I, I'm trying to use that immunity to widen the parameters of debate in the right tone, because I believe that when these topics are not addressed, then the, the Dukes and the Farrakhans of this world are strengthened, because they say, in effect, we are speaking to the secret, suppressed longings of people. The mainstream politicians won't touch the issue. So there's been a racial polarization in which people on the right and on the left have been strengthened by this kind of radicalization. I think that when these issues are aired, are candidly discussed, uh, that the effect will be to come up with more sensible policies. Now, it'd be no surprise that uh, liberals would not embrace your, your analysis or, or your book. But you've had surprisingly little support from the conservative black 
uh, community. In fact, I think some of your former colleagues have resigned from the American Inter Enterprise Institute, of which you're part, and said some terrible things. The Mark Furman of public policy. Why aren't you getting more support from the conservative elements of the community? Well, two two black conservatives have have um, uh, criticized me quite harshly, and one of them, I think, in a rather ill-considered moment that he, I think, has regretted, uh, said that. Uh, that's an example of the kind of poisonous rhetoric I think that prevents the debate from moving forward. Uh, but other black conservatives, including Thomas Sowell, many of us have rushed to my defense. So there, there, is, there are two sides of this. And I also point out that there are many liberal scholars, African-American scholars, ahead of the NAACP, ahead of the uh, Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, who have praised the book. So the book is getting a very unexpected reception across, across the spectrum. Well, you, you do the more than simply analysis. I mean, you're prescriptive at the end. And you talk about the fourth option, an option that hasn't been explored yet, where we should have governments who are race neutral, but we should allow the private sector to discriminate, to be free uh, to discriminate. And, and, you, and you justify this, that this, in fact, will help black people. Again, help me with, with that particular. Fact. Well, actually, if you, uh, I, I didn't begin the book thinking that. Mm -hmm. And yet then I discovered that ethnic groups in the United States have always succeeded by helping their own guys. Uh, ethnocentrism in that sense is good when it is harnessed for, for, for gain. So if you look at the Italians, you look at the Jews, you look at what the Koreans are doing now. You go to a Korean grocery store in Washington, D.C., and you peek in the back, 15 other Koreans. Uh, it's one way that immigrant groups have overcome their historic obstacles, lack of not speaking the language, for example. Um, if you don't that this, this Korean grocery store owner is functionally practicing discrimination. He's not he's hiring he's quotas. Discriminating, he's, he's discriminating in favor of his own, and I think that that's good. But I mean, that, um, that's happening already. You're not seeing any people saying that you know, the real problem with American society is that black businessmen Men are hiring too many white people. No, no. See, what we have now is a double standard in which, in which uh, discrimination on the part of minorities is okay, but right. discrimination on the part of whites is not. The Republicans have talked about the race-neutral society, colorblindness. Well, the problem with colorblindness is because blacks are not competitive with other groups. If you strictly enforce colorblindness in the public sector and the private sector, there would be almost no blacks at MIT. Blacks would begin to vanish from many selective professions. The irony of legalizing private discrimination is I am quite confident that there would be far more discrimination discrimination in favor of blacks than against blacks. Virtually every uh, public company today, uh, IBM, AT&T, Procter & Gamble, discriminates in favor of blacks. And that would continue. And I think it's OK. It should continue. You don't think that that discrimination is a function of the, the kind of the government sanction that says affirmative action is good? Not anymore. It used to be. But what's happened is that these companies and these universities have set up affirmative action sectors within their companies so that even if the government were to step back, I think many of these policies would continue. In fact, when I was a member of the Reagan administration, the government had talked about ending racial preferences. And there was an outcry. And many C heads of companies said, oh, no, don't do that. Or if if you do that, we will continue to do what we're doing. Affirmative action has, in that sense, become a way of life. I'm worried that if we outlaw affirmative action, a great deal of government intrusion would be required to go to private companies and, and force them, don't act this way, don't hire this guy, hire this guy instead, almost on the same scale as was required a generation ago to uproot the old discrimination. You, you, have, you have no concerns that we might revert back to the old Jim Crow status, where I'm a restaurant owner and I just say, well, then no black people are going to eat here. Well, remember that the restaurant owners did that in part because the prejudices against blacks eating alongside whites in restaurants were so severe that many restaurant owners, in effect, claimed rational discrimination. They said, we don't have anything against blacks, but none of our customers would come. Well, this is, you know, this is one way in which the world has changed. And moreover, the law in the United States basically says if you have a restaurant or a motel and you put up a sign open to the public, you are a quasi-public institution, so you are held to different standards than, say, a private company. What do you say to the, the well-meaning critics who say, you know, you, you have opened up a debate that has been too long muted or, or, or one side? I mean, in fact, there are serious problems with affirmative action and the preferential treatment system that we, we have, have put forward. But in doing it the way you've done it, you inflame the argument further. You make black people crazy. You make black people say horrible things about you. You give uh, ammunition to to white racists who otherwise would be left to their anti-intellectualism. I think the opposite is true. I think this is a subject on which many normally sensible people uh, lose their reason. Uh, and so, for example, you have uh, a Washington Post reviewer of my book say, 
D'Souza promotes theories of genetic superiority, even though I explicitly say the opposite. Or you will have people say, well, he says that slavery is a racist institution, exclamation point, exclamation point, as though this settles the matter. Um, I make a, an effort in this book to, to address questions in a, in a sober, in a scholarly tone, uh, beginning with assumptions, then raising questions, then looking at evidence, then a lot of interviews. I talk to black scholars, white scholars. I, I have a range of opinion in the book.